Tim, uh, and some of the words are actually in this promo video to help us kind of get ready for this today. So check this out. Did you know there was such a knot as that? Like, I, I thought that was the coolest thing ever, that you could actually tie a knot that looks like a heart. I don't know. Just me? I thought it was pretty sweet. I was like, that's pretty awesome. So, hey, uh, thanks for being here today, and welcome to week number two of a series, uh, obviously, that we started last week called The Ties That Bind. We're talking about relationships. With Valentine's Day coming this time of year, it's always important, we think, to spend a little bit of time talking about the difference in our relationships between what it means to have the kind of relationships God wants us to have as opposed to the, the kind of relationships that we often settle for. I'm going to say that again because that's big. See, God has an intention for our relationships. And that intention is that he has a, a best version of what they look like. And oftentimes we settle for what's not the best version of our relationships. Now, let me go ahead and address the tension in the room, okay? Uh, <laughs> if you're married, you're thinking, oh, man, I'm sitting next to this person, and this is going to get a little awkward. And I'm just going to let the tension out and tell you, it is. <laughs> uh, if you're single and you're thinking, I don't even know, man. Again, single, single again, whatever it is. You, you might be thinking, like, what is it for me? Well, I'm, I promise you there's, there's something here for you today. It doesn't matter where you find yourself because, again, these are relationships are a part of our lives and and god intended relationships to work a certain way he intended them to be covenant relationships in nature and not contract relationships in nature what's the difference well again a contract is based on a list of things that you promise me you'll do and then i promise you i'll do and then if you don't hold up your end of the contract then we break the contract those relationships are disposable. We, we say, nope, it's, you're not holding up your end of the bargain. I'm not holding up mine, so I'm not going to hold up mine. And then we dispose of those relationships. Now, if you've learned anything in the last couple of years just by watching the world today and kind of watching how things work in the world, relationships have become even more disposable in our society today. More now than ever. We just write people off. Not, just, not, not to mention, come on, somebody, the unfriend button. You're just like, and we're done. Yes? The unfollow button. And we're, we're, we're all set. Or the block button. Yes. So, again, we, we've, we've learned these things, and I want to make sure you understand. I'm not saying that there's not boundaries or things we should set up in our relationships. But I do think it's important for us to understand the difference because if there was a thesis for this series over the next four weeks it's this is that god does not want us to settle for disposable versions of relationships he wants us to settle for relationships that need to be developed not disposable relationships developed relationships there needs to be development again even for some where relationships have been broken the development might just be Again, forgiveness, reconciliation. There's a lot of different pieces to this puzzle that we're putting together, and relationships are complicated. So we've been digging in really to Ephesians uh, 4 and 5. So if you've got a Bible, you can just you can turn there in Scripture. And we're going to be basically reading this over and over and over again on, over the next several, several weeks. If you've been 
tuning into the 714s in the morning, you know we, we're sticking in this passage of Scripture. These two chapters in the Bible are packed full of truth. And I promise you, if you're like, man, I would really love to get my relationships right. I would love to get this right, to nail this. It would be awesome if I could figure this out. You're going to find a lot of truth in those two chapters of the Bible that are, it, it will help you do just that. Very helpful. There's so much truth there. And so we're going to dig into that today. In particular, we're going to pick up in Ephesians 5. I'm just going to read this to you. I'm just going to read sections of this as we go through to give us a context about what we're going to talk about today. So here we go. Ephesians 5.1, it says this. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We're, we're, we're beginning off with the context. Paul is the writer of Ephesians. He's writing to a group of people like you and I in Ephesus. It was a church gathering of people that he was talking to them about their relationships. And what he starts off with is this idea, you need to follow God's example. You need to not settle for your version of what relationships are. Because if you settle for what your version is, what you're going to find out is then relate, that relationships are less than uh, impressed, <laughs> less than impressive, less than fun. They're, they're, a, they're, they're a mess if you settle for anything less than God's example. And so we have to see God's example in order to know this uh, and understand that we are dearly loved children. That God sees us as his children, that he wants something better for us. Come on, parents, you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, you're trying to figure out how to, want, how to give your, your kids better things, but you want better things for them. And that's what it's saying. It's saying God's heart for us is, man, I really want something better for them. That's, that's the foundation of where we're starting. So we're going to look at Jesus. We're going to follow God's example. And then what was the example? He loved us and he gave himself up for us as an offering. He sacrificed. He was sacrificial in his nature, in his approach. He was humble in his approach. Jesus didn't come onto the scene and said, I am God. And I want you to know. What did he do? He came and he gave his life up. For, for the purpose of us. So again, uh, when you think about our posture as we walk into this conversation, the posture is not, I am the man. And the posture is not, I am the woman. That's not the posture. The posture is the heart of God here, following God's example. Pick up in verse 8. For you were once darkness. I thought that was profound. I'm like, wow, Paul, thanks. <laughs> he just went for it. He's like, you... You were a mess. So <clears throat> you were once darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. So live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light, in other words, what does light, light look like? It consists of this, goodness, righteousness, and truth. This is, what, this is what that fruit looks like. So in other words, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, if you call yourself someone who's going after God's best, in your life and in your relationships, there should be some fruit growing on your life. If you're still walking into the room and not turning on the light switch, what Paul's saying is there's a light switch available. You need to turn the lights on. You need to start walking in this light because this is what's available to you. And in this, you'll see these things, goodness, righteousness, and truth. And you'll find out what pleases the Lord. That's important. You'll, you'll figure it out. It won't be like, you know what, I'm trying to, remember, remember the book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus? Remember that book? I don't even know who wrote that, Dr. Spock or somebody, who knows? I don't know. But what, what we figured out in social science is this. We figured out that, man, this is complicated. We can't figure this out. We're trying to understand how this all works. We're trying to make sense of it. But the key here is Paul saying, listen, bottom line is you were once walking with regards to your relationships you were once walking into rooms that the light switch wasn't on. You were walking around in dark rooms. You're bumping into each other. You're not really sure why it's not working. But now that you've come into the light, now that you've started to, to embrace Scripture and say, this is what I want. I want God's best. 
not what I want, then what has happened is that light switch has flipped on and goodness, righteousness, and truth are available to you. And that is how you find out what pleases God. That's how you know. You, you flip the light switch on and you start walking in these things. Verse 15. So then be very careful how you live. In other words, don't just walk through life thinking, ah, it's not a big deal. I'll just go through. It's no big deal. I mean, it's not really important. Like, what I say in this moment is not really that big of a deal. Uh, <clears throat> there's been many times in my life where words have come out of my mouth. We're going to get to that next week, by the way. <laughs> where words have come out of my mouth, and I just look at the look on my wife's face, and I think, oh, boy. That does not look like goodness, righteousness, or truth right there. I done screwed this up. I'm like, the stuff that came out, I didn't, I just was kind of just going through the motions. I didn't think about it. I was just kind of, you know, I was just doing my thing. I wasn't putting much thought into it today. I wasn't really putting much effort into it today. But Paul says, be very careful. Watch this. Pay attention to this. Keep this on the front of your minds. Don't live as unwise people, but live as wise people. God has given us wisdom. We should use it. Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Come on, somebody. The days are evil. The statistics on marriage, let, let's, just, let's just throw it out there, married, married couples. They are not good. They're not good. So wherever you find yourself in that conversation, you need to understand these are hard. This requires effort. We have to be very careful how we live. And there's wisdom that God has given us, but this wisdom does no good for us unless we're willing to call it wise and use it. Paint it on the walls of our lives. That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Loving each other can be difficult. It can be a struggle getting this right. In our marriages, in our families, I've, I've talked to more, more families recently than I can even tell you who were like, we, we just don't, mm -mm. unfriend, unfollow, block. I'm like, that's your family. Yeah, but we're, we just don't see eye to eye. I mean, do you see the device of the enemy here? Do you see the device of the enemy which just seeks to divide and, and, and pull apart? When we can't see eye to eye, when we can't figure it out, when we don't know what the, the answer is or we're not sure how to fix this, I won't ask you to raise your hand, <laughs> but I'll raise mine and tell you. I cannot tell you how many times that I have literally come to that realization looking myself in the mirror in the morning as I'm getting ready. I have no idea how fix this i've either said too much done too much they said too much they've done too much i had a whole list of things a whole list of reasons and i looked myself in the mirror and thought i do not know how we're going to fix this but i want you to know <laughs> if, if you could circle one sentence in ephesians 5 this is the remedy this is it. This is the remedy in how to fix this. Whatever this is. Come on, somebody. Who has a this? I'll ask you that. Who has a this? Yep. Whatever this is we're trying to fix. Yep. Here's the remedy. Are you ready? It's one sentence in verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let me pray. God bless this message and amen. That's it. Well, I, <laughs> no, Jason, I understand. But I mean, there's more to the story. You just don't, you don't, you don't know the situation. No, I, I know I don't know the situation. But, but I promise you this, God does. And in the fact that God does, the, the truth that we get out of just this one line right here, Ephesians 5, 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, there should be a mutual agreement between you and the person that you are in a relationship with. This is hard. We can't do this on our own. 
We need God. And the only way that this is going to work, the way that God intended it to work, is if we humble ourselves and go after God's best. Amen? It doesn't happen any other way. You don't just fall into a great marriage. Man, I don't know what happened. Like I just tripped and fell into a great marriage one day. It doesn't happen. That's not how it works. It takes work. It takes effort. That's why I threw out Scripture, 1 John 3.11. For, for this is the message that you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Matthew 22, Jesus replied, Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This is the greatest commandment. And second, love people like you love yourself. Matthew 5.44, but I tell you, this is a tough one. Love your enemies. <clears throat> Pray for those who persecute you. When we display that kind of love, that kind of work ethic, when we show up within our relationships with our hard hats on, ready to get to work, put your tool belt on, put the hard hat on and go, we got some work to do. You know what that does? That tells the world around us who we are. Jesus said the world will know you by your love for each other. It doesn't mean that it's all roses. It doesn't mean that it's all chocolates and caramels. It's not that way. We got to show up with a hard hat and we got to say, I got to get to work here. And what is the one thing that I need to be working on? Ephesians 5.21. That's what I need to work on. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That tells me two things. There needs to be a mutual agreement, mutual submission in this relationship. To say, I don't have it all figured out. I don't have the answers. But we can do this together. But then there also needs to, that also needs to be done out of reverence to Christ. I can't do that out of reverence to my person that I'm trying to have this relationship with. I can't, I can't say, like for me, I, I can't just say, Janelle, I am going to submit uh, it, like in, in this relationship to you, I'm going to submit to one another out of reverence for you. That will only get me so far. That will only get me so far. I have to take that approach, submit to one another, because I am thinking as I submit myself to my wife, as, as she submits herself to me, that we're doing so to honor Christ. That's why we're doing this. And people see that. They see that we're we're both mutually agreeing to do that because our lives are not about us, everybody. They're about Jesus. They're about the world seeing Jesus in us. So that's where this reverence and respect comes in. That's why it's really, really important that we get that today. Let me me just dig into this for a second because this is kind of taboo in our society today. What is biblical submission? What is biblical submission? Usually when you talk about this, uh, in my experience in church throughout the years is this. When you start talking about submission, uh, what what happens typically is the men step up and go, it's about time we had this conversation. (laughs) Been meaning to have this conversation for a while. And the women step up and go, you really going to go there? (laughs) You're going to do this? Let's go. We doing this? That's usually what happens. Let me try to bring it to a different perspective, though, today. Okay? You ready? Somebody's laughing. You're kind of sitting back going, how's he going to spin this? Okay. All right, here we go. First thing, what is biblical submission? First thing, biblical submission is about mutual harmony. It's about mutual harmony. What does that mean? Well, that that, that means simply this. Like, there's, there's this idea that, Submission to each other really should be an intertwining factor that brings us together in perfect harmony. You, you know, like whether you're musical or not, you're not like you don't really, you know, if you're if you're not a singer or, or anything like that, maybe this might seem odd to you. But like harmony is a, is a musical concept. It's a concept when a, a melody line and, and a harmonic line come together in perfect unity like it's not that one piece of that vocal 
is more important than the other. It's that what happened is those two vocals, the melody line and the harmony, lined themselves up and they made one new voice, one new sound together. They couldn't make that sound without each other. If I sing the melody line to you, it's incomplete without the harmony on the song, the third or the fifth, if you know some music in there. Like if I don't sing the third or sing the fifth, there's no harmony to that melody line. But even if you're not musical, listen, you recognize good harmony. You know how I know? I see your faces. Sometimes when, when, when we're singing a song or whatever, if, if we're a little off musically, like if, if, if the harmony's not good, even if you don't know music, your face kind of goes, ew. <laughs> right? Mm. You ever heard of bad, like, like singers getting up there and they're going to rip and the harmony just, ew. you're like, I don't know what's happening right now. I'm very uncomfortable. I'm sweating. Right? And you don't have to know jack about music, but you'd be like, man, why is my neck itching? Like, this is, this is really uncomfortable. That's bad harmony. You ready today? <laughs> you ever get around a couple where there's bad harmony? You're like, why is my neck itching? <laughs> Better yet, have you ever been the couple? <laughs> you ever been that couple? I know I have. When I've walked in and I made a bold statement and thought my wife was with me. God, she's with me. I'm like, I said something and then she's like, nope, that is not the way it is at all. I'm like, babe, what are you talking about? No harmony. Right? But I will say this you know when harmony is good too. Again, you might not know anything about music, but you can recognize when harmony is good. When it's good, you're like, man, I don't know what happened. That moment, it just had a lift to it. Like when the vocals came together and they lined up together, there was a mutual, you know, they started working together. It wasn't one person singing and another person singing. It was that both voices came together and made a new voice and sang together. I got an example for you today I want you to watch of good harmony and I want you to watch in particular watch the judges because it's it's a clip from the voice watch the judges faces during this clip when these harmonies are sung check this out Come on, guys, you want to hit that high note, don't you? I see you. You're like, Wee! if you could hit your, come on, get in that car after church today. I want you to look at your lady and be like, Wee! told you we were going there today, didn't I? Come on, biblical submission is about mutual harmony. That's what it is. We don't even understand. It's like, again, we, 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 We've learned. Obviously, they didn't just come out that day in that moment and sing that song that well. They had practiced. 
They rehearsed. They said, we got to get this. We got to get this straight. We got to put the work in here and, and get this developed. Let me see when you're when you're moving up and I need to move up with you in, in, the, in the vocal range or, you know, again, how do we accent each other? That's what biblical submission looks like. It's a bind of unity that brings us together. And that bind of unity speaks volumes. Do you see the judges? They were like, they kept looking at each other like, whoa, whoa. And that's what happens in our relationships. When we're walking in that kind of unity and love with each other, when we get this right, that's what happens. Other people around us are like, man, how do you guys do that? How do you walk in that kind of unity together? What else is biblical submission? It's unto the Lord. Second point, biblical submission is unto the Lord. I do it as unto the Lord. Ephesians 5.21, let me take you back there. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's, it's all about me showing people Jesus. It's about me as a participant in this relationship being focused on showing Jesus through our union and our relationship together. Even with your family members, your friends, your co-workers, everybody. These relationships, these mutual bonds of unity are, are, are given as a reverent fragrance to God, a reverent gift or sacrifice to God. Listen to this, verse 22. Wives, submit yourself to your own husband as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. So submit yourself to your husband like you're submitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Here you go. Everyone can say a good amen on this one. Children, <laughs> obey your parents. <laughs> but it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. In the Lord, out of reverence for God, for this is right. Workers, obey your, ma your earthly masters with respect and fear. Oh, wow, are you talking about my boss? Again, what's the most important thing? The most important thing is that when I would go to work, people would see that, that, that I am in mutual unity, in relationship with people so that they could see Jesus. Not that so I could be right in the meeting or whatever the case might be, that they would just see Jesus. Respect and obey your earthly masters with the sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Do it as unto the Lord. Do this as unto the Lord. Our submission to Christ displays itself in how we honor and respect other people. So does that make sense? If I'm not willing to submit myself unto my person, if, if you will, as unto the Lord, then the truth is I'm probably not willing to submit all of me unto the Lord. I mean, that's some tough truth, but it's an important thing for us to, man, we, we need to let that sink in today. That's what it shows the world around us. The, the, the third thing is this. Biblical submission is about structure. It's not about being better than or less than. Uh, biblical submission is about structure, not about being less than, better than or less than. Galatians 28, it's not in your notes, but it says this. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor even is there male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. All of us are one in Christ Jesus. When it comes down to how God sees things, that's how he sees things. So we think that, again, it's about a stature or a status. Right? Well, when you read things like, you know, again, wives submit to your husbands, men love your wives. We're going to dig back into that here in just a second. We think like status on, on the totem pole. That's not what this is saying. It's saying it's a mutual, it, it's, it's a mutual oneness, a mutual togetherness, a structure by which God has established for the purpose of showing this world Jesus. That's why he established it. So let's look into that more. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit yourself to your own husband as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And this is where the men are usually like, 
amen to that. <laughs> but again, remember, it, this is not a status piece. And, th- and, and let me also say this. This is not the 50-50 game. Anybody played the 50-50 game in your life? I've been married 25 years. I played that game with my wife. Well, we often even sometimes play it still today. (laughs) But we played it a lot when we were first married. The 50-50 game. You know what I mean? I got my card in my back pocket. Keep score. It's like golf. Every hole. We got to write the score down. I mean, yes, I did the dishes. Bam. I parred that hole. Yeah. Yeah. Not only did I I do the dishes, I wiped off the counters, too. That means I birdied that hole. (laughs) And then we get to the end of the day, and we pull the scorecards out. How'd you shoot today? How'd you shoot? How'd how'd your round go? Oh, you shot over par today. Oh, okay. Again, like, like you didn't shoot as well as I shot. This is not the 50-50 game. That is not what this is saying. What this is saying is, this is the 100%, 100% game. You have to give yourself 100% over to this. Wives, you have to give yourself 100% over to this. Husbands, you have to give yourself 100% over to this. It's not a 50-50 game because it goes on to say in 25, husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You think you got off easy? What what Paul just said is, you should love your wife so much that you're literally willing to die for her. That you're literally willing to lose yourself in the pursuit of her. To give yourself up as a sacrifice for her. A pin drops in the room. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Give, and he gave himself up for her to make her holy. Watch this. Man, I love you. I'm I'm about to get in your grill here today a little bit, okay? Gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. If you are a man... Loving your wife means you have to be in your Bible, period. You need to be in your Bible because you cannot love your wife. You cannot wash your wife in this word. You, I mean, again, if I said, hey, who, man, who wants to sign up for giving your wife a bath? You're like, let's get it on. Absolutely. That's what you're like. I'll give her a bath. Come on, Jason. Mm. Paul. (laughs) I'm so sorry, Jesus. But this is the soap. This is the soap. What good is a bath without the soap? This is the soap. Uh, Men, we got to get in this. Come on, our world needs us as men to step up. We got to step up. We can't, this is not a time to shrink back. This is the time to step up and say, if you want to know what the mark of a man is, get in your Bible. Get in here. Come on, jump in here together. Let's keep each other accountable to that. Let's ask ourselves the question, are you, do you, are you bringing the soap to the bathing session? Because loving your wife means showing up with the soap. Showing up with this in your heart and, and, and reminding your family that there's a peace of God that transcends all understanding. Reminding your family, bringing them together that, that says there's a joy in the Lord that goes beyond our strength. When, you, when, you're, when your family or your children or whoever it is get around you, they're, they're just, you're a fountain of this, of this washing that just, this is what leading and loving is all about. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And then to present her to himself as a radiant church. What does that mean? 
That, that means this. That, that means like, it's not like, get behind me, babe. That means this. That means I open the door for you. You are very precious to me. That's what loving is. You're very precious to me. You mean the world to me. You're everything to me. I'm willing to give my life up for you. Again, presenting her to himself, a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but you feed it, you care for your own body, just as Christ does the church. And we are all members of his body. Okay. <laughs> Everybody breathe, take a breath, okay? Whew. We got through that, all right. All right. So now, if, I mean, I guess for, for me, just uh, I've only got, I got five minutes, so I got to wrap this up. Listen, if you want to know what the key is, it's in that one sentence. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. If you want to understand what the ingredients to that are, it's right here. Love and respect. Love and respect. How are men and women wired? Isn't it interesting that what, what Scripture tells us is that women, what needs to be the most important thing to you is respect. Reverence in, in the fact that, uh, you know, a res- there, there's a respect piece because if you want to know what men really need at the core of who they are does this mean men don't need love no it's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is they value respect higher than love now if you're a woman you're probably going they are crazy what is wrong with them if you flip that around women men here you go you want to know what the the key is the secret ingredient love they It's not that they don't value respect. They do. It's that they need love. They need your love. They need you to pour your love out for them. Lay your life down for them. Right? Married people argue. You ever argue in your marriage and you're just like, you've been arguing for like an hour and you're like, I don't even remember what we're arguing about anymore. (laughs) Like we're sitting here looking at each other. It's like we're arguing our case. We're doing our thing. You ever argue till the issue, you're just not sure what the issue is anymore? I know I have with my wife. And I, I want you to understand this. When you've argued to the point where the issue is it's gone, it's just not the issue anymore, and you're wondering, what's the issue? <laughs> what are we even arguing about? I promise you it's these two words, love and respect. These are the words. A survey given, a recent survey uh, given out, to men and women ask this question would you rather feel alone and unloved or inadequate and disrespected how do you think this went (laughs) 74 percent of men said i would rather feel alone and unloved than i would rather feel disrespected 74 percent said that what do you think when the same question was asked to women (laughs) what did they say A large percentage of those people said, I would rather feel inadequate and disrespected. Uh, Women said, I would rather feel inadequate and disrespected than I would feel unloved. I need to feel loved. I need to, that's what I need in life. Isn't it interesting that that's what these scriptures dial into? Wives, again, submit yourself to your own husband as you do to the Lord. That's a respect, that's a respectful posture. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. That's a loving posture posture even for couples right now that maybe you're like hey listen my my significant other isn't really even following jesus listen to this i got good news for you today first peter three one through two wives in the same way submit yourself to your own husband so that if any of them do not believe the word they will be won over without words by the behavior of their wives When they see the purity and reverence of your life. Think about that. That you could love and respect in such a way, even when they don't earn it or deserve it. Even when they don't earn it or deserve it. You could do that in such a way that they would see Jesus in you. And they would want to to know more about Jesus. Husbands, Colossians 3. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. Don't be harsh with your wife. Again, why? Because God's been gracious to me. God's been loving to me. 
The, the key here is unconditional. Those are the ties that bind. It's unconditional love for each other. Are you challenged today? Give me, a, give me this challenge. Are you challenged today? Come on, because I believe that we can have these great things that God wants for us in our relationships. I believe we can go after these things. These are the ties that bind. One thing I need you to leave with today and understand is this. Your relationships matter. They matter to God. They matter to God. They tell the story of who Jesus is. To the world around you, to your friends, to your family, to your coworkers, to your loved ones. I'm going to leave you with this. Ephesians 5.32. This is a profound mystery. <laughs> This is a profound mystery. We're, we're all trying to figure this out. We're all trying to experience the best. We all want these relationships that God says we can have. But it's a mystery to us sometimes. But whenever you're lost in that mystery, understand this. I, this is what the Bible says, but I am talking about Christ and the church. If you ever get lost in this journey, if you ever lose your way, you ever trying to figure out what to do next, where to go next. Focus your eyes, your attention on the relationship that Jesus has with us. That's the key. Because the truth is we will never get our relationships right with each other until we get our relationship right with him. Amen? Let's do that right now. Will you bow your heads with me? Come on, in this moment, maybe you've heard today's message and it's challenged you in ways that you're ready to make a change. You're ready to move in the direction of something better today. I want you to know it all begins with you getting this thing right with Jesus in this moment, right now. He is not holding anything against you for the words that you've spoken, for the things that you've done. No, it's all grace. It's all mercy. It's all love. It's open arms to you today. All you have to do is take a step in that direction. Just in an honest conversation right now between you and God. If you're ready to get things right with Jesus today, pray this prayer with me right there where you're at. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I don't want to do this on my own anymore. It's a mystery I can't solve on my own. So today, I open my heart to you. I'm asking you in this moment to forgive me for the things I've said, for the things I've done that I'm not proud of. But today, I take a step towards your grace. I take a step towards your mercy and your love for me. I did not earn it or deserve it. But you did it anyway. Because you love me and you want good things for my life. So I receive that gift today. Come into my heart. Fill me with your spirit today. Be the leader and Lord of my life. From this day forward, I'm getting it right with you today prayed that prayer today for the first time and you're turning your feet to Jesus, do me a favor right now across this room. No one's looking around. It's just a moment. 